Today, we're going to be painting the Red Gobbo and Bouncer. I've built the model in two stages, all of the squig parts in one, minus a single leg, and then all of the rest in the other build. This is to give us best access to the goblin's clothes and the squig's back, so that we don't miss any details. We're going to start off with the inside of Bouncer's mouth and gums, as this area is enclosed and we'll need to get it done before the teeth and skin around it. Using some thinned Barracknar Burgundy, we're going to build up a few coats until we have a solid base layer painted. Throughout the tutorial, I'll refer to thinning paints. I primarily use water as my medium for most paints, and the mix will depend on the paint itself. It's better to over thin your paint and build up more layers than it is to slap on the paint too thick to start with and struggle to correct it later on. With a nice solid base coat applied, we can now thin down some Drukai Violet, or another dark purple of your choice, and apply a thin shade all over the gums and the inside of the mouth. Using a purple here helps reinforce that colour theme we started with the Barracknall Burgundy base coat. We want the gums to look fleshy, but still retain their reddish hue, so we're going to mix some Barracknar Burgundy with some Bugman's Flesh in a roughly one-to-one -one mix. Then we're going to use the mix to start to highlight the gums, outside and in. For the tongue, roughly stipple the paint from the back of the tongue to the front. Moving into this and our subsequent flesh tones will make the gums look a lot more like living flesh, as they're colours we associate with in real life. Switching to pure Bugman's Glow, we're going to add further highlights, while reducing the amount of area highlighted. This means we'll get a nice transition from the darker to lighter colours. Again, step with this paint close to the front of the tongue, and don't forget the parts of the gums on the inside of the mouth. If you don't feel confident adding more, thinner highlights here, then you've reached a good point to stop. However, if you want to keep going, we're going to add a final line highlight of Cadian Flesh Tone. Remember to thin it and focus it only on areas that you want to be the brightest colour. You can draw your brush into a finer point by rolling it as you remove some excess paint, which will allow you to achieve a thinner highlight. The gums are looking fantastic, and we're going to finish them off with a very small amount of Kislev Flesh. Carefully dot this around and select locations where you want to give the impression of the brightest sections of the mouth. Painting small dots like this can be used in almost everything we're going to be painting on the model. You want to try and aim for almost as small a dot as you can paint, So if this is too large it can sometimes look out of place, so it's worth practicing this on spare sprues or getting these dots on the extreme edges of things.
Now, squigs come in lots of colours, and quite a few shapes as well. For this lovable little ball of slobbering flesh, we're going to use the paint squig orange, which is quite an apt colour to use, I think. We're going to thin it and keep applying layers until we have a solid, opaque base coat. Most importantly for this, in the next few steps, don't forget to paint the leg attached to the other part of the subassembly, as we want it to match the main body, and it's far easier to paint it at the same time than it is to try and match it later on. This section did take around four coats to get a solid opacity, but I did use a hairdryer to speed up the drying process in between each layer. To give Bouncer some colour, and to help add shape to the various muscles and folds of flesh, we're going to start glazing various reds over the skin. Start off by heavily thinning down some Mephiston red, and begin applying it around anywhere where there are wrinkles in the skin, such as around the eyes, mouth, legs, feet, and other areas where the skin ruckles. Use several layers of your glaze to build up the intensity of the colour. The skin is great for practising glazes on, as you can give folds and muscles shape. Moving on to corn red, we're going to do the same thing and glaze this colour into the deeper recesses, ensuring that we leave some of the Mephiston red showing to create a transition between the colours. Focus your glazes around the warts, eyes, mouth, deeper muscles and the toes. As a final recess shade, we're going to use some Galvorbach Red, thinned down and applied only to the deepest recesses. By this stage, we should have a good variety of colour on Bouncer, and he should be starting to look like a happy little squig. I did still want to add a bit more character to the model, knowing what's already sculpted, so I went in with some more Galvorback red and started giving Bouncer some freckles. Now, this is obviously optional, but I think it adds a little charm to the model. As we've used a lot of glazes to build up shades, we can use less highlights at the other end and still end up with some great looking skin. To that end, we're going to mix some squig orange and some fire dragon bright and apply a quick highlight to raised areas of flesh, such as around the mouth and eyes, all the warty protrusions and some of the ridges in the skin where muscles have pulled it tighter. With this, the skin is finished.
to base the eyes, we're going to use a small amount of Avalan Sunset. Thin it to ensure we don't leave lumps in the eyes, then apply a few coats to get good coverage. This isn't a particularly vibrant yellow, so we will work in some extra brighter colours after this to bring them to life. To brighten up the eyes, work some thinned aerial yellow into the centre of the eyes, making sure to leave some of the Avalon sunset peeking through around the edge. In the same way as before, thin down some flash gets yellow and boost the brightness of the centre of the eyes by applying a couple of coats. To tie all the colours together, use a thinned orange of your choice. In this case, I'm going to use Fugan Orange and glaze it over the eyes. Make sure you don't apply this too heavily though, or we'll obliterate the variation of the yellow that we just painted on. Finally, dot some black pupils into the centre of each eye, using a black of your choice. I'll be using Abaddon Black. If you want your squiggo to appear more confused or looking like it's gone into the mushroom storage, make the pupils different sizes as though they've dilated at different rates. To get pupils looking in the same direction on any face, I try and visualise the face of the model looking at something on my desk, and work out where the pupils would have to be to focus on that. You could also add some dots of white here to make the eyes seem shiny, or a thin layer of gloss varnish instead if you choose. With a lot of bouncer finished, we're going to need to take a bit of a detour. Now he's eaten some of the cable that comes out of his mouth and wraps around his leg, so we'll want to paint this before his teeth, as the teeth will block access to the back of his mouth and this little detail. Base all of the cable with a black of your choice. Again, I'll be using Abaddon Black, as I like that it has a slightly glossier finish than other blacks we could use, and power cables here in the UK tend to have a slightly glossy finish to them, so I imagine that's what it's supposed to look like. Apply a line highlight of dark grey, like Mechanica Standard Grey or Russian Grey, along the length of the cable. For the section in Bouncer's mouth, make sure you add some highlights to the tip of the cable where he's bitten it off. This will start to make the cable look like it's a glossy sheen to it, which will reinforce the satin finish of the previous layer of black. Also, don't forget the cable on Bouncer's base. Next up, add a thinner highlight line of Dawnstone along the highlight line you just previously painted. If you make any mistakes, you can always go back and cut into the highlight with your black to help tidy it up and maybe redo the stage.
Moving on to the other cable that wraps tightly around the one we just finished, we're going to use Death Weld Forest. Now Christmas lights tend to either be a deep green or a pine green colour to help them blend in with Christmas trees, so this will be perfect for that. It'll take a couple of coats, so take your time, and always rotate the model in your hand to access the hard to reach areas rather than trying to move your brush hand into uncomfortable positions. To highlight the green, we're just going to use a single colour, the Strachan Green. We don't want the appearance to look too shiny, or the cable wouldn't be able to blend in with the tree, so we're going to leave it at this, which is nice and desaturated. With the interior of the mouth now finished, we can look at getting the teeth started. We'll be using Deepkin Flesh, as there's a bit of a green tint to it, which looks great as a base for Xenos teeth, as it looks though they're starting to go green and rot. We're going to use the same paints to also coat the antlers at the same time. The thought process here is that I don't imagine orcs to be the most sanitary creatures, and I reckon there's likely some rotting, mold and decaying flesh on the antlers still. Now we want to mix some Bane Blade Brown into our Deepkin Flesh in a roughly one-to-one -one mix, then thin it down so you can start glazing it onto the teeth to build up dirt and decay. Don't worry about having the neatest transitions here, any messiness just looks like gunk and plaque build up. On the horns, use this to add shadows and build it up in the recesses, as again, the horns are going to have a similar finish, so we want it to look like it's just decaying and dirty in the same way. Take some pure Bane Blade Brown and work it into the lower one third of the teeth, or the top one third on the upper set of teeth, to continue that build up of dirt and decaying matter. Again, on the horns continue to reinforce the shadows by applying this into the deeper recesses.
As our final Rita shade, move on to Pure Steel Legion Drab. Thin it slightly, and paint a consistent line into the deepest recess of each tooth, almost staining them with dirt and pluck. Let's tidy up the teeth a little bit by returning to our deepkin flesh and putting the highlight line back into place at the front and sides of the teeth. If you want to add some nicks or tiny scratches to the teeth, you can use this colour to cut back in and add some micro damage nicks to the teeth. Rather than finishing on pure white, we're going to use an off-white, like Belay's model colour Ivory, to add some final highlights to the top one-third of each tooth. Alternatives would be to use something like Screaming Skull from Games Workshop, or White Sands from Scale 75. Moving now onto the bits of cloth wrapped around the tail and a couple of places on the horns where they hold baubles in place, we're going to base these areas with thin du shabti bone. This is a good cream colour that will take three to four coats to build up. Again, you can use a hairdryer to speed up the drying time in between layers.
Using thinned Reichlin flash shade as an all overwash, you can add some colour to the wraps. And while it's an all overwash, I'd recommend concentrating it on the recesses and lower sides of each piece of cloth. As a deep recess shade, we're going to make a one-to-one -one mix of Rhinoxide and Doombull Brown. We're using the Rhinoxide in this mix as it's a great dark brown, and we're bringing in the reddish properties of the Doombull Brown. Thin this, and then apply it carefully to each recess. Going back to our Shabti bone from earlier, we're going to re-establish the edges of each part of the wrap, and paint this as almost a highlight around everything. As a proper highlight for each edge, we're going to use Thin Screaming Skull as a natural progression up from the Ushabti. For the Santa jacket and hat, we want to go with a nice vivid red, yet make it distinct enough that it stands out from the squig below. To do this, we're going to start off with thinned Mephiston red. It's going to take a few coats to build up the opacity, so use your hairdryer to speed up the process between each layer. To shade these sections of cloth, we're going to mix Incubi Darkness in with the Mephiston Red, 
in about a 1 to 1 ratio. This makes a fantastic looking burgundy that is slightly different from the Barragnol burgundy we used earlier. If you're looking to skip mixing paint then you could easily use that Barragnol burgundy instead. We're going to make sure that we shade each recess and then heavily thin some of the mix and use it to add shape to some of the model, such as in between the shoulder blades where there's a hollow, under the hat and where the jacket ripples. You can either leave this how it is, or add some more incubi to the previous mix to darken it further, and then paint it carefully into the deepest recesses. The green in incubi darkness is complementary to red, and as it is so dark it looks fantastic as a recess shade when mixed together like this. To tidy up our shades, go back to your thinned Mephiston Red and glaze a couple of layers over any way you want to transition between your shades and your midtone. The more glazes you're willing to do, the better this will hide the transition. If you're happy with stronger changes in colour, then you can skip the step entirely or not do too many layers. Moving up on the spectrum for our highlights, we're going to use Evil Sun Scarlet and add a chunky highlight to all of the edges or raised ripples in the cloth. This paint starts to have orange tint to it, which keeps the red saturated without getting too close to the Fire Dragon Bright which we used for Bouncer earlier, which helps keep the two different areas of the model distinct from each other. As our next highlight, apply some Wild Rider Red, thinned, in a tighter line than our chunky highlight, so that we'll still see some of the Evil Sun Scarlet in between this stage and the Mephiston Midtone.
As a final dot highlight, use Deathclaw Brown to touch the tip of your brush to any corners of a robe or top of the rippling cloth. We're using this paint as it closely matches the look of faded cloth when applied sparingly to red surfaces, so it helps sell the finish of the cloth by looking like something we associate with real life. I'm going to go a bit mad in this stage and base coat every surface that's going to be any tone of white or grey. Use some thinned grey seal and build up the coats carefully so that they're nice and smooth. We're going to paint the snow base, the beard, the trim to the robe, the flare and the smoke trails themselves. Don't forget to paint the pom-pom on the end of the hat. We will need to do what I did, which is go in later and repeat these steps. The reason we're using grey as a base for our whites is so that we highlight up from grey. If you base coat with a strong white, you're never really able to go much brighter, so you're always left with a fairly flat looking surface as you can, the only colour you can go is down. Focusing on the base now, snow and ice often has a blue tinge to it, so we want to thin down blue horror until you can use it as a wash, and then carefully shade the base with it so that it catches in all of the divots. Next, repeat the same step as before, but this time with Fenrisian Grey. Focus on shading any of the deeper sections of the base so that we get some tonal variation from our original bright grey down to this deeper blue. We can use some snow effect later on, but if you're wanting to skip that, then this is where we're going to stop with painting the snow, so make sure you tidy up if you're not going to add anything later on. For the beard and fluffy trim of the red jacket, we can use Apothecary White as a shade. Thin it with Contrast Medium for the best effect, and apply it sparingly to each area of grey on the jacket and beard. As mentioned previously, we'll highlight up from grey to white so that the white looks like it has highlights and therefore some depth to it. In this case, we're going to use two bright whites that do have a slight difference to them. The first of these is White Scar, which you, th you should thin and then use to highlight the beard. To get a fluffy effect on the trim, start by stippling the White Scar over the surface. 
To do this, you may need to use some unthinned or only very lightly thinned paint so that it's slightly tackier and leaves a stronger finish when you dot onto the model. Our next highlight is Vallejo's Game Air Dead White, which is slightly brighter than White Scar. You could also use Pro Acryl's Titanium White, or Vallejo Model Color Cold White if you wanted to try other very pure whites. Repeat your highlights and the same stippling effect to help build up the second layer. It will be very subtle, but there is some variation which helps give it some depth. The next step takes practice and a steady hand but is a great effect to practice for any pipes or cables that festoon a lot of other 40k models. We're going to paint a stripe around the flare with Caliban Green, thinned of course. I'm going to use the hand as my starting point and as a size reference and slowly build up the thickness of the stripe until it's the right width that I want. But don't worry about adding lots of layers and increasing the opacity until you've got the shape and thickness you want as you can always cut back in with Gracer at this point to tidy up your swirls. Once you're happy with the lip flow, which I am with two swirls next to each other, add some more thinned layers of Caliban Green to leave a solid block of colour in each swirl. I've also painted the top and bottom of the flare with Caliban Green. To make the finish appear glossy, run a line of Gracie up one side of the flare, and then on the complete opposite side. Make this line thick enough that you can highlight it afterwards. Also, add a chunky edge highlight to the top of the flare with the same paint. Add a white scar highlight to the reflective line we just added to the side of the flare, as well as around the top of the flare, and this will start to have the same effect as the white we built up on our previous sections of cloth a minute ago. Finally, add a Vallejo dead white highlight to the same areas to finish off the flare, and give it a glossy appearance. With the flare finished, we now want to turn our attention to the Red Gobbo's skin by thinning down some Scarsnit Green and building up the opacity with several layers of thin paint. There are a few ways of painting orc skin to suit your preference, which relies on varying how many dark green glazes you add or how much yellow you use to boost the saturation of the brighter skin tones. For this Gobbo, 
we're going to keep the skin quite desaturated so that all robes and squig appear more colourful in contrast. Using thinned contrast orc flesh, start to add some shape to the skin by glazing around the prominent features on the face, as well as in between the fingers and around the wrists. I chose to repeat this process three times to slowly build up how strong the finish is while still showing the scar snip green. As before, don't forget the other goblin's hand on the other part of the sub-assembly. As a very deep recess shade, we're going to use thinned Ingubi Darkness. Use a brush with a very good tip and carefully paint the recesses directly rather than relying on a wash consistency to get the pigment in the right place. We want to do this because it's a very strong colour, so we want to be very careful about pigment placement and don't want to lie on random chance and hoping that the wash gets it to settle in the right location. To highlight the skin, use Nerdling Green as a thin glaze on all of the edges and raised fleshy areas of skin, paying particular attention to the tip of the nose and the ears. For the fingers, apply the paint to each knuckle, and if you're able to, add an edge highlight to the top and bottom of each finger to make them appear slightly segmented and giving them a bit of definition. As our final highlight, mix some Vallejo model colour ivory into the Nurgling green in a one to one mix and add some more extreme highlights to the areas you just painted. You could always use something like Creed Khaki, Ushabti Bone, or Phalanx Yellow, depending on how yellow you want the surface of the skin to be. For variety in a unit of orcs or goblins, it's worth experimenting with bright off white colours to see what you like the most and give a bit of individuality to each model. For the Gobbo's pants, we're going to use a black of your choice. Again, I'm sticking with Abaddon black. Thin it, and base coat the trousers, boots, belt buckle, and also Bouncer's claws. This should only take a couple of layers due to the primer matching the base colour. oranges and orangey reds were used for Bouncer's skin, and the red robes were quite warm, so we're going to use cooler colours to highlight the boots to get some more contrast and colour temperature on the model. To do this, we're going to use some blues to highlight the blacks, first of which will be Thinned Dark Reaper, and applied as a chunky highlight on the edges of every area we just base coated. Next up, we're going to use Thunderhawk Blue as a thinner highlight over the Dark Reaper. Use this highlight to map out the brighter areas of the black, restricting it to the upper edges of the boots and raised folds of cloth on the legs, and the tops and sharp points of the claws. Finally, touch some Fenrisian Grey to the top corners of our highlighted sections. As with some of the earlier stages in this tutorial, you want the dot to be very small so that it acts as an absolute final bright highlight.
Similarly to how we base coated all the whites and greys with one paint, we're now going to base coat all the silvers with thinned iron warriors. This is everything from the hairband holding the horns to the goggles, gun, grenade pins and baubles. This is a dark metallic with good coverage, so it should only take a couple of coats to apply. When applying metallics, don't mistake black speckles on the surface as part of the paint's finish. This is often primer showing through, and is a surefire sign that you need another layer to boost the opacity. When shading metallics, we don't want to remove any shine from the metallic flakes by coating the surfaces in a matte paint like Nolan Oil, as that just kills the finish. Likewise, we don't want to make it so shiny that a magpie wants to use it for its nest. To get a satin finish that keeps the metallics sheen, we're going to mix Nolan Oil and Nolan Oil Gloss together in a one-to-one -one mix, so that the matting and gloss agents mix together and stop either one being overpowering. I made my mix by putting a couple of new pots of each of this paint into a separate container, so I always have some ready to go. I use this wash on almost all of my metallics, and this model we will be washing all of the metallics. As our highlight, we're going to use Iron Hand Steel and apply it as an edge highlight to things like the gun, grenade pins and headband. We're also going to use it as a layer for the baubles and Christmas lights by adding a thinned layer to imply a brighter, shinier side to the said items. As Bouncer has eaten the string of Christmas lights, I don't really imagine they're working very well anymore, so I wanted to simulate a look of stained glass bulbs that are switched off. I'm going to use Scale 75's Ink Tense Yellow as a thin layer and build up the colour on the bulb, focusing more layers on the centre and tip of the bulb so that it looks like the bottom section attached to the cable is slightly more see-through. To add some tonal variation to the bulbs that we just painted yellow, I'm going to give a thin, all over shade to each bulb using some thinned Fugan Orange. For shiny metallic baubles, we're going to use several layers of clears to build up a coloured surface that still shows the metallic through. While I'm using Matarian Green for this, the paint is no longer available, so you could use something like Tamiya Clear Green as an alternative. This takes two to three layers to build up a solid coat, so take your time. Alternative methods to using clears would be to find a pre-made coloured metallic you wanted to use instead, like those from Turbo Dork. Or you could use inks, or mix some colour into a bright metallic paint yourself and use that as your base coat. For our remaining baubles, I'm going to use Calf Blue, another sadly out of production paint that you can easily replace with Tamiya Clear Blue. I went with blue and green baubles due to the amount of red we already had on the model and wanting some colour variation. Adding some colour to grenades always makes them a bit more interesting on a model, and I always tend to use greens, which works really well in this instance as it again contrasts nicely with the reds. Using carbolite green, apply a chunky highlight to each square around the edge of the grenades. Following this, slightly thin down some sybarite green and apply an extreme edge highlight to each square on the side of the grenades. Finally, apply dot highlights using gorse blaster green.
At this stage, I realised that I'd failed to paint the piece of cream cloth tying the pom-pom to the tip of the hat, so I'm going to go back and reuse our steps from earlier. I also thought this would be a good recipe to use for the label on the pistol, so I'll paint that at the same time. To remind everyone, we started with Yushamti Bone as our base colour. Also use this time to base coat the goblin teeth, and then leave these alone until we come back to them later. We then shaded the surface with some thinned Reichland Flesh Shade, trying not to overpower the cream too much. A one-to-one -one mix of Doombull Brown and Abaddon Black gave us a dark reddish-brown deep recess shade. Don't forget to shade underneath the label where it will be the darkest. Finally, we highlighted with Screaming Skull to finish off the cream cloth, and in this case, the edges of the label. To make ourselves a mix that will look good as a colour for the text on the label, add some more black to the Doombull Brown and Abaddon Black mix. To paint the text, I started by painting all of the vertical lines that make up the letters in the word red. I start with the middle letter, as it lets me get that central point set in place first, before moving on to the other two letters. This is a fantastic tip for any amount of letters that you're doing in a single word. Always start from the middle point get that in place first. Once you're happy with the verticals, add the rest of the lines that turn them into the letters. Moving back to the base, use some Steel Legion Drab as the base coat colour for the woody protrusion at the back. Make sure you use a couple of thin coats to build up the opacity. Going back to our Doombull Brown and Abaddon Black mix we just used for the lettering, thin this down and use it as a shade for the woody sections. This will bring some warmth into the wood. Apply it as an all over shade so that it tints every surface so that our next step stands out. Go back in with Steel Legion Drab and paint lines up and down the length of the wood to simulate wood grain on the surface. By slightly tinting the surface in the previous step, this should allow the Steel Legion to look like a subtle change in surface texture. Thank you. 
reinforce this wood grain effect by using Bane Blade Brown and adding another highlight over each line to brighten them up slightly. Also use this as a quick highlight on the knots on the surface of the wood. There are a few small branches coming off the wood that we're going to colour match to a couple of areas of the model so that we have some consistent colours in each area of the model. We're going to use Deathworld Forest as the base coat for the branches. This matches the cable we painted earlier and makes it clearer that the cable might be used in a tree like this for decoration. If you recall, we painted it in Deathworld Forest earlier so that it had that piney effect to it. Next up, we're going to use Thinned Orc Flesh again as the recess shade. This brings in some of the green tones from the orc skin and unifies a couple of the green themes that we have on the model. Finally, add some highlights using Strachan Green painted onto the tips of each bit of leaf. For our big shiny gold star and the medals under Red Gobbo's chest and hat, we can use Retributor Armor, thin down and in a few layers to get a good solid base coat. Similar to our Noln Oil mix from earlier, I'm going to shade these gold metallics with a one to one mix of Reutland Flesh Shade and Reutland Flesh Shade Gloss for the exact same reasons of getting a satin finish. Again, I use an empty container and put a couple of pots of each paint into this to have the mix always ready to hand for my golds. As a highlight to the gold, we're going to use Liberator Gold. Make sure to shake this paint for a long time as it has a bad habit of heavily separating in a way that pulls all the metallics into a clump at the bottom of the pot that makes them quite hard to mix together. If you need to stir them, Make sure to use something solid so you're not getting all these metallic flakes stuck in the bristles of a brush. Let's return to those goblin teeth that we base coated earlier and apply a thin shade of Agrax Earth Shade. The matte finish doesn't matter here, so we aren't going to mix with anything. The Agrax Earth Shade is to add an impression of dirt to the teeth. Add a quick highlight of screaming this gold to the tips and edge of the teeth to give them some shape and to finish them off. To get some depth to the lenses and to add a splash of colour to the chest of the goblin, we can use Calidor Sky as a deep vivid blue base coat. Thin it down and build up a couple of coats on both the lenses and the metal straps. Chunky highlight the lenses and edges of the medals with thinned techless blue, which is a natural progression colour from our previous Calidor Sky.
as an extreme edge highlight, use Fenrisian Grey for both sections of the model we just painted. Finally, use a touch of blue horror to add reflection points to the goggles and to the corners of each part of the metal straps. For the bar holding the metals in place, we're simply going to use some iron hand steel. Realistic smoke is very hard to paint, so we're turning the insubstantial into a solid surface. We're going to thin down to black Templar contrast and slowly build up a transition from the start of the smoke, a flare, to its tip right at the back. This is a mix between a glaze and a wash, and we're going to concentrate it into the sculpted recesses of the smoke. Apply the same mix again, this time over the back two thirds of the smoke. Make sure it's thin so that it naturally looks like there's a transition at the point it starts to get darker. We don't want the smoke to look as though it's chunks of different colours in between the first and last two thirds. Finally, use the same mix again, this time on the final one third of the smoke. When finished, this should look like the smoke gets darker the further away from the flame we get, and also in the recesses at the most dense points of the smoke. Really thin down some grays here to an almost glaze-like consistency and apply it to the upper areas where the smoke billows. This is to bring the occasional bit of brighter grain to the swirling smoke. It is not to relay the entire length or the steps we've just did would be wasted. Finally, speckle some white paint, in this case Vallejo's dead white, on bits of the smoke. This doesn't need to be too dense, nor too overwhelming, it's to give an impression of ash and a bit of depth to the smoke. To get a good glow at the heart of the flare, thin down some Wild Rider Red and add a few glazed layers to the tip of the cord, and add some small patches in the smoke near where the flame would be, right within this heart of it. Next up, 
thin down Far Dragon Bright until it's also a glaze-like consistency, and restrict this very thin bright orange to the actual point of fire, leaving yourself a reddish glow down the cord where the Wild Rider Red is still visible. Within the smoke, dot this paint in so that there is still some Wild Rider Red showing again. Finally, mix mural yellow into your Fire Dragon Bright and apply it as a final really saturated highlight to the absolute brightest point you want your flame to be. If you aren't going to add any snow product to your base, then you've finished, and you should have a slightly mad looking Happy Christmas Squig and Lunatic Rider. To add a snow effect, we're going to use some AK Interactive snow products. Get yourself a mixing dish, some water, some AK snow sprinkles, and some AK snow micro balloons. Start by getting some snow sprinkles in your dish, and a touch of micro balloons. I'm using a small spatula for this, as the micro balloons are a very fine powder that isn't picked up that well by a brush. Next, add some water and mix it all together before dabbing it on the surface of the base. Keep going until the whole thing is covered, and if you want to get it really thick, you can add more to the surface on top of that last layer. Leave this to dry for a while so that it sticks in place and becomes quite solid before our next step will end up looking like hard, compact snow. Next up, take some AK Terrain Snow, thin it with some water in your dish, and then dab it over the surface. I only use a small amount of water to thin the product, as it had dried slightly in the months since my last use. You can leave it quite thick if you want to make textured surfaces by moving it around with your brush. If you want it to go very smooth, you can add more water so that it naturally smooths out as it spreads over a surface. Finally, while the terrain snow is still wet, sprinkle some more micro balloons across the surface so that they'll be fixed in place as the snow dries. This will leave a finish very like fresh powdered snow across the surface. You'll also see that I use a wet brush to go back in and move snow away from the items scattered across the base so that they're still visible in the snow. With that, once you've let it dry, we're done! <laughs> 